Okay, welcome to the 39th annual PILC. I'm just gonna give everybody a few seconds to start coming into this live stream before I get going. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 39th Annual Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. My name is Michelle, and I'm a 1L content representative for Land, Air, and Water. Today, we are live streaming this panel onto our YouTube channel. There is a chat function on the side of the stream. Feel free to ask questions for the panelists. Uh, we will attempt to answer any specific questions after each panelist. All the panelists will give their presentation, and then there will be a short Q&A session at the end. I will also be adding a link to a Google document in the chat. This Google document has information for any legal professionals looking to get CLE credit for this panel. This panel is pending CLE accreditation. Also our alumni board, Friends of Land, Air, Water, who helped to provide stipends for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law internships are accepting donations. If you're interested in making a donation to help provide students with those stipends, information for that will be on the Google document as well. Today's panel is titled, Bringing Justice to Animal Law, Lessons from the Environmental Justice Movement. Presenting this panel, we have two co-founders and staff attorneys from Environmental and Animal Defense, Jeremy McKay and Alexa Carreno. Since 2017, Jeremy has participated in both federal and state courts on a wide variety of legal issues for clients that include animals, homeless, indigent, middle class, and other nonprofit organizations. In addition, he represents environmental and animal defense and its members in an organizational capacity to ensure state and federal government accountability, responsiveness, and transparency. He was awarded the Top 40 Young Lawyers Award by the American Bar Association in 2019. He holds an LLM um, in Environmental and Natural Resource Law and Policy, a Juris Doctor, and a Certificate in International Studies from the University of Denver Sturm School, uh, College of Law and received his bachelor's degree from the University of California, San Diego with a major in literature and writing. Since 2017, Alexa has practiced in both federal and state courts to provide quality, affordable legal representation to Colorado citizens while, using, while also pursuing environmental and animal protection claims at the federal level. She holds an LLM in environmental and natural resource law and policy from the University of Denver Sturm College of Law and graduated with her Juris Doctor from Chicago Kent College of Law with a certificate in, in environmental and energy law. She re received her bachelor's degree from Northwestern University with a major in linguistics and a minor in environmental policy and culture. She teaches environmental appellate advocacy at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law to prepare students to compete in natural environmental law moot court competition. She also publicly advocates for advancement of animals in the legal system and is a practicing vegan. Without further ado, panelists, I will hand it over to you. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Hello and good evening, everyone. I would like to say thank you again for attending our panel, Bringing Justice to Animal Law, Lessons from the Environmental Justice Movement. I'm Alexa Carino and my co-panelist is Jeremy McKay, and we are coming to you live from Denver, Colorado this Sunday evening. Michelle did a great job of introducing us, so we'll just leave you with this. If you find yourself looking for more material after this panel, we would invite you to check out the book, What Can Animal Law Learn from Environmental Law? With that, we can get started. If you would have asked someone 50 years ago, what is environmental law, they may be hard pressed to give you an answer. While laws protecting the environment did exist in the 1970s, environmental law was far from mainstream. Even still today, many may be unfamiliar with what environmental justice is. We're at the same juncture today with animal law. Tonight, we would like to share with you how the environmental justice movement shaped environmental law and environmentalism from something that was controlled by the elite and white community and included eco-fascists into something that incorporates all voices and all communities. Taking that knowledge, we will look at the intersection between environmentalists and the criminal justice system turning then to the intersection of that same criminal justice system and how it impacts 
uh, animals and people who interact with animals. It may be surprising for you to then learn how justice and inequality issues are rampant among not only people, but in how animals are treated as well. Finally, we will discuss some considerations and possible remedies that animal advocates can take as lessons from the environmental justice movement and incorporate it into creating a more inclusive animal advocacy movement. First, to understand the necessity of the environmental justice movement, we must look to early environmentalism. The early environmentalists of the 1900s craved wilderness of the West and the illusion of an environment untouched by man, largely ignoring the fact that many indigenous Americans had been living in and managing that environment for centuries at least. These early conservationists combined their desire for a pristine environment with that of a pristine human race as well, spreading white supremacist rhetoric that was even praised by President Theodore Roosevelt. For these elite wealthy white men, conservationism and the creation of the nation's parks and preserves was about saving nature for its aristocratic benefits and qualities. President Roosevelt prized the noble elk and buffalo for hunting, which fueled his motives for preserving them. Revered environmentalists such as Gifford Pinchot and John Muir advocated for eugenics and called Native Mexicans and Native Americans dirty, uncivilized, and lazy, and described them as an irksome presence in an otherwise godlike natural environment. These men sought an escape from the trials and tribulations of mundane life and the perceived threat of losing power as the majority race in America. Something to keep in mind here as we approach history of the modern day, these revered environmentalists are remembered for their respect for non-human life and the wild places that they treasured, not for their belief that each human had a right to participate in those wild places or see those wild creatures. They are known for caring more about what they described as animal people, the animals they felt kindred relation with, such as big game animals, but did not bat an eye at the suffering or even extermination of people of color. While it's true that we may be thankful for the efforts of these early environmentalists to protect wild spaces through the creation of national parks and national monuments, we must also be critical of opinion that is not a mere average ordinary racism of the day, if there is such a thing. After the initial spark in the early 1900s, through the progression of the 20th century, the seeds of the environmental justice movement were sown alongside the civil rights movement. One of the earliest actions of the environmental justice movement was the Memphis sanitation strike in 1968. This strike was inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King himself in a speech to the group of sanitation workers the very night before his assassination. We've got to give ourselves to this struggle until the end, he said. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. We've got to see it through. This strike was fueled by the death, neglect, and abuse of Memphis's Black employees of the sanitation department. Dr. King also recognized that social justice depended upon environmental justice, including healthy living environments for underprivileged communities and universal access to clean water and air, preaching that all life is interrelated. But still, Popular environmentalism of the time was marketed as a collective issue when really just aimed at the white elite. For example, in President Nixon's 1970 State of the Union address, he described the environmentalist cause as a cause beyond party and beyond factions, which for the time really meant it was a cause for the white majority that could serve his political career. It was not until the 1980s that the environmental justice movement began to take hold. In 1982, African-American community members organized a protest in Warren County, North Carolina to oppose a planned polychlorinated biphenyl or PCB landfill. PCB is a known carcinogen. This proposed hazardous waste landfill would be dumping thousands of tons of PCB contaminated soil into a facility in this African-American community. 
This event is largely cited as the catalyst for the founding of the environmental justice movement. Um, here, I have a short clip of some news footage from that protest that I would like to share with you. We will not allow Warren County to become a dump site. The State Highway Patrol began moving in on the marchers as they approached the entrance to the state landfill. The signs and chants of the protesters made clear their opposition to having the toxic chemical buried in their county. I don't want this stuff thrown in my water. We're marching because we do not want this to affect our future. If you do not cease this unlawful act, you will be arrested. The leaders of the protest said they would not move, and they were the first arrested. As they were being escorted away, the crowd moved in on the entrance. Many of the marchers then sat in the road, and the patrol began arresting them and placing them on a jail bus. State officials said they had no choice but to make the arrest if they were going to move the people out of the way and get the trucks in here. One protester jumped in front of the first truck and was quickly hustled away. In all, 10 trucks arrived for the first dumping. As they unloaded the PCB soil in the landfill, state and federal officials defended the decision to stop protesters and to store PCB here. We were hoping that we were going to have, of course, <coughs> just a protest, but uh, you witnessed the fact that there was an, an attempt to obstruct, which we simply could not. Uh, allow to continue. We feel very confident that we built a facility that uh, is going to work uh, the way in which it was intended and uh, we intend to just carry this project out to its completion. And State officials say they're determined to continue the operation until they get the job done. Brenda Summers, WBTV News, Warren County. More than 500 environmentalists and civil rights activists were arrested at this protest. While the protest efforts ultimately failed and the landfill was developed, it sparked the conversation of inclusion across the country to understand and prevent environmental racism. This public outcry caused the federal government to study the correlation between hazardous waste sites and low-income communities. The report found that 75% of all hazardous waste sites were in fact in low-income African-American communities. In 1987, another study titled Toxic Wastes and Race, conducted by the United Church of Christ Commission on Racial Justice, found that over 15 million African-Americans, 8 million Hispanics, and half of all Asian Pacific Islanders and Native Americans inhabited communities with at least one toxic waste site. This data was enough for environmental justice leaders to criticize the conservation community and traditional environmentalists. In 1990, these leaders signed on to a letter delivered to the major environmental groups, such as the Sierra Club, famously founded by John Muir, accusing these organizations of contributing to the racist and classist treatment of American citizens through the narrow scoped and elite environmentalism of the past and encouraged them to do better. They stated, although environmental organizations often claim to represent our interests, in observing your activities, it has become clear to us that your organizations play an equal role in the disruption of our communities. They called upon these organizations to not only take into account the concerns of the diverse community, but to hire diverse employees until they made up 35 to 45% of an organization's staff. President Clinton responded, in, responded to this disparity in impacts by issuing an executive order aimed at creating an interagency working group tasked with identifying and implementing environmental justice strategies within the federal government. However, progress was not great. In 2007, the anniversary study Toxic Waste and Race at 20 found that people of color were even in higher concentrations around hazardous waste facilities than shown in the 1987 study. Without a federal environmental justice statute, agencies were forced to explore solutions within an existing statutory framework. 
With this in mind, the Environmental Protection Agency began exploring ways in which Title VI of the Civil Rights Act could intersect with environmental justice efforts. Section 601 of the Civil Rights Act generally prohibits uh, discrimination based on race, color, or national origin by any entity or program that receives federal funds. Section 602 allows federal departments to issue their own rules, regulations, or orders to implement this anti-discriminatory motive. The EPA has promulgated regulations that prohibit the agency from engaging in practices or distributing federal funds in a way that causes disparate impacts of discriminatory effects. Title VI also became the beacon for environmental justice activists through litigation. Environmental justice communities have sued in federal and state courts under Title VI and have filed Title VI administrative complaints with the agencies that are accused of the discriminatory action. However, this pathway has proved limited success in both arenas. The Supreme Court held that the Title VI litigation must meet the extremely high bar of proving that discrimination was intentional, as well as held that agency regulations prohibiting disparate impacts does not create a private citizen's right of action. Therefore, the only solution environmental justice communities have is to file administrative complaints, but the EPA has failed to take meaningful action on Title VI complaints dating all the way back to 1993. In 2012, responding to this faulty complaint process, environmental justice communities demanded that the EPA do four things. One, rescind prior agency decisions and settlements in order to ensure proper enforcement of Title VI within the agency. Two, request oversight from the DOJ's Federal Compliance and Coordination Section to help EPA institutionalize and streamline the complaint investigation and enforcement process. Three, actually respond to hundreds of public comments on the 2000 EPA revised draft guidance for investigating Title VI administrative complaints challenging permits. And four, establish a date by which EPA will complete all investigations and pending complaints. In 2017, the EPA issued a toolkit to provide technical assistance to funding recipients to provide guidance and support EPA's compliance when investigating and resolving discrimination complaints. EPA also issued its final strategic plan and case resolution manual aimed to efficiently and effectively manage its complaint docket. This manual was actually revised and published on January 5th of this year, and it's available on the EPA website. This is just one of the few ways in which environmental justice efforts continue nearly 50 years after the beginning of the movement. Thus, environmental law as we know today was shaped by the convergence of three issues creating the backlash that necessitated change. Environmentalism used to protect limited interests, a lack of input from other communities about environmental use and benefits, and the early failure of environmentalists to address the environmental impacts on minority communities. The road was slow and burdensome, and many could argue that as we stand here today, almost 40 years after the Warren County sit-in, environmentalists have not done enough while diverse voices are obligated to be considered under the law, they are not obligated to be adhered. There is more work to be done today. The environmental justice movement is becoming more stifled as we speak, where the community struggles to gain legal foothold with its limited set of tools. Lawmakers have begun exploring ways in which they can punish environmental justice activists, such as criminalizing peaceful protests by essentially deeming these people as eco-terrorists. For example, Louisiana has utilized its power to deem oil and gas infrastructure as critical infrastructure to more harshly punish environmental protesters who trespass during their protests. Over 11 states have similar laws and where pipelines and power plants are proposed and lobbied by big industry, environmental justice communities suffer not only the long-term health consequences, but also the immediate consequences of voicing their dissent. 
while there is more work to be done to truly achieve environmental justice, the ultimate point is that there's recognition that environmental justice work must continue and is integral to achieving environmental protection goals. At this point, I would like to turn it over to Jeremy to talk a little bit more about the state of animal law. Okay, um, so I'm Jeremy McKay. I've already been introduced both by Alexa and Michelle, so I'm just gonna get right into things. Um, I'm going to be talking about some animal law statutes a bit, but before I move in to talk about animal laws, I wanna give some more background context about this criminal justice element that Alexa has really led into my discussion with. I think it's also important to elaborate on these issues because while they aren't exactly environmental or animal issues, um, they have significant impacts on both fields. Uh, I'm also aware we don't live under a rock despite mostly having not left our houses for the last year, but we should all be aware of the Black Lives Matter and criminal justice reform movement that's now a national well-known issue. Uh, nevertheless, to grasp the full context of the animal law issues we are discussing today, I think information on the criminal justice issue is very pertinent. Uh, as environmental justice arose as a response to observable or oversights in the then current environmental law, we similarly think that animal law needs the same kind of movement, um, which we have dubbed animal social equality. The need arises from observable practice trends in animal law that focus on, on niche interests and overlooks affected communities and people specifically in the criminal justice context. Um, Narrowly focused animal protection issues, similar to the early environmentalism, has promoted laws and enforcement practices that are tinged with racial prejudices and disparate impacts. Um, I'm going to start by providing some graphics so you aren't just listening to me describe these numbers. Uh, so first here is the incarceration rates in the United States over time, where you can see starting around 1972, uh, they quintuple. Where now today, nearly 2% of all adult males are incarcerated. Um, now this by itself doesn't really tell us much of anything other than maybe we're living in some sort of dystopian police state. But what this chart really will show is the magnitude of the problem that we're going to be discussing today related to criminal justice issues. Um, this next chart uh, describes the incarceration rate disparities between ethnic groups, where you see on the left here, uh, the rates for Black moving to Latino, Hispanic, and then whiter Caucasian, where African-Americans are incarcerated at rates six times that as white or Caucasians, with Latinos at two and a half about times that rate. So the point of showing you this is to really demonstrate how criminal laws generally of any kind are necessarily disparate in their impacts. For it's a for example, it's a near guarantee that the state environmental protest laws that Alexa referenced will very disproportionately be used against people of color. Think of the Dakota Access Pipeline protests where they water gunned Native Americans in freezing temperatures in what looked like a war zone. Um, in fact, we're gonna watch that right now for a few minutes. And I'd like to, before we watch, think about even the protest context from the PCB uh, compared to what you're going to see in this video and the difference in militarization that you see uh, over time between these two periods. My name is Chase Iron Eyes, and I was there during the Dakota Access Pipeline protests. I belong to the Titua Oyate Na Ocheti Shakomi, also known as the Great Sioux Nation. I'm the lead attorney for the Lakota People's Law Project. So at the time that the pipeline fight was beginning, in the, in the early days, there was a community meeting at what is known as Long Soldier District. So that was kind of my beginning as to being noticed that Energy Transfer Partners and their CEO, Kelsey Warren, intended to violate our treaty rights and our inherent rights and force us at gunpoint to accept the financial extractive dictate, especially when they had planned to put it north of Bismarck, North Dakota, which is, I think, something like 90% European American. 
I was there standing with Standing Rock on August 13th, 14th, and 15th. During those days, nobody knew what energy transfer partners were going to do. As I remember, those who were willing to risk their liberties and their freedom and get arrested would go in an act of civil disobedience and chain themselves to the very gate where energy transfer partners wanted to build a transport road. Several mounted horse women and men came onto the scene and that's what the enemy saw. When they see us on our horses and those horses are leading us into those situations, it backed up the entire police unit. And while that was happening, four women up on the hill decided to go forward of their own volition and they crossed the fence line. Those women led us into unknown territory, territory that we had not known since 1889. I was there when 80 people rushed that fence line after these four women demonstrated that bravery. And these women went straight for the heavy equipment. They offered their bodies in a sacrifice to put themselves between financial extractive genocide and ecocide and the future of their families. Soon as Big Oil found out where our sacred sites were, they sent their team, guarded by a private security firm with deadly attack dogs to go and destroy these sites. They had moved their heavy equipment more than 20 miles from where they were working on Highway 6, and they had leapfrogged all the way up to these sacred sites and began to destroy them. Hundreds of us were putting ourselves in harm's way. So when these attack dogs were being presented as a very credible threat to unarmed women and children, the warriors of that day took it upon themselves to drive this security team and Dapple's heavy equipment operators back to where they came from. I was there when peaceful water protectors were attacked and brutalized on Backwater Bridge. Flashbangs. This is my first experience with this sort of weaponry. And it was like the 4th of July. There was all sorts of flares, all sorts of less lethal bullets. The things that they're using on protesters today, Black Lives Matter protesters, but it's more than just Black Lives Matter. Obviously, there is a revolution happening right now, but it began at Standing Rock. I was there and I saw blood running from people's eyes. I saw blood running from people's limbs where these security forces, these private mercenaries, were maiming people. If any were mad enough, get the fuck over here. I'll be waiting here. In 20 degree weather, the National Guard, they had a fire hose and they were spraying all of the water protectors and coating them in water in freezing temperatures. It is an endangerment to human lives. And they knew this. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of a difference of how dramatic um, state governments and federal government now act uh, against protesters or against people generally with uh, criminal justice issues. Before I move on, I'm actually going to ask everyone here, um, and with understanding that I actually won't be able to see your responses till a little bit later, but does anybody actually think that the issues of criminal laws targeting environmental protesters, as we saw here, um, of energy infrastructure to be a serious environmental law issue, or do you view it separately as only an environmental justice issue? Um, and the reason I ask this, it, it's kind of rhetorical in a way, because I actually have my extreme doubts that anyone's really going to think that it's not just an environmental law issue. Um, 
because the issues are so interconnected to each other now. Uh, if you think or feel otherwise, feel free to message or put in the chat and state why, and we can maybe address it later. But what I'm really trying to highlight again is the interconnectedness between environmental justice now and environmental law. Um, for example, ecofascism is not something entertained by environmentalists these days, unless it's done maybe unwittingly by some more careless discussions of issues surrounding population. Um, I mean, for instance, uh, the statements that Alexa referenced by mere denigrating Native Americans would not be something remotely tolerable today for any environmentalist to say outside of a alt-right rally or conference attended by Richard Spencer. Um, totally unacceptable. Um, moving forward, Incarceration is not really the only indicator of disparate impacts in our criminal justice system. Um, enforcement without conviction or incarceration both have disparate impacts towards minority communities as well, including their deaths. Um, here we can see uh, a graphic that details lifetime risk of being killed by police. And we see except for Asian and Pacific Islanders, other minorities, including Latinas, Native Americans, African Americans are killed by police during enforcement in significantly higher numbers than whites with African Americans at the top here at ratios of about 100 and 100,000 per capita compared to Caucasians or white at about 39 and 100,000. Uh, giving the same examples before, this means that minority environmental protesters are equally more likely to be killed in the enforcement as they are to be arrested in those draconian critical infrastructure laws referenced earlier, which now, since this time of the Dakota Access Pipeline protests, uh, I believe both North and South Dakota now have these critical infrastructure protest laws. These disparities grow worse in the criminal justice system, uh, the lower on the social hierarchy you tend to go. Um, and animals are some of the creatures that are, are, are creatures that are lowest on our social hierarchy ladder. Um, and while the numbers of dogs shot by police officers is unavailable because no agency tracks it, uh, what is available in district illustrates how profound the issues of criminal enforcement in animal law really may be. Um, in this study uh, and this publication, a U.S. Department of Justice publication titled The Problem of Dog-Related Incidents and Encounters states that the majority of shooting incidents involves animals, most frequently dogs. The same report provides an example of how over the course of two years in one police department, 75% of the shooting incidents involved shots fired at dogs, resulting in 44 dog fatalities. Now, this data was supposed to be start to be tracked a little bit more earnestly in 2016. Prior to that point, there was no real national database for animal crime um, reporting. Uh, but in 2016, the Federal Bureau of Investigation began tracking crimes against animals the same way it tracks other crimes against humans, such as you know, homicides and kidnappings. Before the change, police tracking lumped animal crimes into an all other offenses category and had limited details about those uh, offenses. This change is part of a nationwide effort to transition all law enforcement agencies to adopt new reporting systems with enhanced data. Um, there's only a few years of data currently, and so there's limited ability to establish long-term trends, but the FBI expects that the transition to this new reporting system to a uh, elicit rich data because the new reporting system requires participating agencies not only to report the crimes, but also the circumstances of crimes, meaning that we're going to have a lot more empirical evidence soon of animal related uh, law issues, including dog shootings. Um, Final comment I'm kind of going to make about criminal justice issues before moving to tie these issues more closely with the animal statutes themselves is the overwhelming gap in access to justice available to Americans, including minority communities. Um, so 86% of civil legal problems reported like by low income Americans received inadequate or no legal help with seven in 10 of those low income Americans with recent personal experience of a civil legal problem saying that that problem significantly affected their lives. Um, 
Now, those same people um, in these categories generally, there, there's a lack of available resources in it that accounts for the vast majority, uh, 85 to 97% of civil legal problems being denied assistance from what's known as the Legal Services Corporation. It's a, a nonprofit government funded organization that's supposed to help with civil legal, legal issues for uh, disenfranchised low income uh, individuals. Um, but finally, as many as 80% of people charged with felonies are indigents, and even those remaining are often lower income classes and may be unable to afford counsel, even if they don't meet the very low bar of being able to, uh, being eligible for court appointed or like public defenders counsel. Uh, the overworked, underfunded, and underprepared counsel representing indigents uh, at public defender's offices end up providing inadequate representation many of the times because of their caseloads, which is an affront to justice and has been argued could be unconstitutional because it causes ineffective assistance of counsel. Now, COVID has made this exponentially worse. I have no empirical data on this. I just am getting reports from individuals who talk to me through public defender's offices, but due to the trial delays, there's reports as of now that when courts reopen and criminal trials again proceed, there's public defenders who are scheduled to have more than 100 trials within the first 30 days. Um, there's no attorney on earth who could effectively prepare for 30 or 100 trials in 30 days. It's more than three trials a day. I, I have no idea what they're supposed to do. This means that either through the criminal or civil side of law enforcement, low income individuals who are disproportionately minorities will disproportionately suffer the consequences of the legal system, even when they are represented in court. Um, so. It, it would probably be unsurprising that these disparate impacts from our criminal justice system substantially impact the field of animal law, not only because animals are the subject of police killings, but because many, many animal laws are governed through criminal justice provisions and criminal statutes, even when those laws are meant to protect animals. Um, animal cruelty laws are some of the most obvious, um, but many, many, many other animal laws uh, are governed through criminal statutes as well, uh, regulations on factory farms, puppy mills, uh, companion animals, dog fighting. Uh, I'd be remiss to fail to highlight even the Endangered Species Act. Uh, their take provisions are federal criminal laws. This means that there will inherently be significant justice issues surrounding the enforcement of these animal laws against individuals because our criminal justice system has such obvious and systemic disparate application towards disenfranchised and minority people. This is further magnified by the fact of uh, the types of people who are in close proximity to animals. While enforcement data is, once again, scarce, uh, the workforce behind animal agriculture is predominantly Black and Brown people living in low-income communities, further necessitating that enforcement of laws concerning animal agriculture predominantly impact those same communities. Um, if you think that law enforcement agencies are going to go after the Caucasian factory manager or company owners, uh, even if they are directing or have told their employees to engage in abusive behavior to facilitate more economical returns, um, I'd ask you to provide me any of those examples or something similar where anywhere in corporate America where they went after the people at the top. Um, again, feel free to just post that in chat or message me after the conference. I'd be very interested in reading about that. Um, other examples of many of the areas of animal law governed by criminal laws are dangerous dog designations, dog bites or attacks, leash, leash violations, at-large violations, zoning law violations for unlawful number of animals or types of animals, animal cruelty, as I referenced before. Even the Americans with Disabilities laws related to service animals now frequently have state laws that criminalize the misrepresentation that an animal is in fact a service animal. Um, breed specific legislation is probably one of the best examples of how animal laws through criminal codes are really mechanisms of open hostility towards disenfranchised or minority communities. 
It also compellingly illustrates the unreasonable bias between different animals while simultaneously demonstrating racially prejudiced nature of many animal laws. Over 700 cities um, across the nation have enacted at some point breed specific legislation uh, or BSL as it's commonly known, prohibiting targeted breeds, most notably American Pit Bull Terriers, American Staffordshire Terriers, Staffordshire Bull Terriers, American Bulldogs, or otherwise known collectively, a lot of the times it's just pit bulls. Um, individuals and family guardians of banned breeds must surrender their dogs before moving into BSL jurisdictions or find somewhere else to live. Uh, BSL initiatives effectively amount to a quiet genocide of pit bulls and pit bull mixed dogs, and may also be targeting minorities specifically to have kept them out of white or Caucasian majority areas. Um, one study um, has suggested that there's a higher perceived relationship between breeds marked as aggressive or dangerous in African-American or Hispanic communities. Um, many BSL laws are enforced through visual identification of pit bulls and pit bull mixed dogs, which has been proven tenuous at best and calls into question the conscious or subconscious racial bias in labeling or identifying a dog as a pit bull or pit bull mix, not based on the identification of the dog, but likelihood and identification by the race or owner of the dog. Uh, for example, in one study uh, demonstrating how poor shelter workers have been able to determine the, uh, uh, what type of a dog is uh, compared to the DNA test results of that dog, uh, the best shelter workers could ever do was uh, no better than 75%. Data also suggests a correlation between changing demographics of a city and the enactment of BSL. For example, in Denver, they enacted BSL in 1989, shortly after a large scale shift in demographics resulting in an increased African-American population in the city. Despite the state of Colorado enacting legislation in 2004 prohibiting BSL within the state, um, the complex rules of Colorado with Denver being a home rule city and allowed the 1989 ban to stand until only last year when the uh, citizens of the city voted to overturn it. Similar correlation is presented in uh, the neighboring city of Aurora, Colorado, which enacted BSL in 2005 after a change in its demographics to reflect an increased African-American population, which has similarly uh, was repealed only as of last year. This correlation is not limited just to the American West. BSL has sprung up coast to coast in line with changing demographics of those areas as evident in, for example, Miami-Dade County or Yakima County, Washington. Uh, this correlation, as well as the perceived relationship between minorities and pit bulls and the lack of data on attacks on the specific efficacy of breed-specific legislation, really supports the inference that BSL is or at least was being used as a misguided and racially charged political tool. Um, now, it makes sense in a lot of ways to use criminal statutes to protect the vulnerable, including animals, outside of these obvious racially motivated laws. Uh, domestic abuse is an easy comparison in this regard. In, in order to protect someone in the United States or even a non-human animal, you have to take the liberties away from someone else most of the time. For example, with a domestic abuse situation, say they're not only abusing their spouse, but the animal in the home is the, as well. Um, well, Say they have a firearm and you want to take away their firearm and take away the animal to protect both the spouse and the animal from the abuser. Uh, to remove the animal from the abuser's custody, the abuser must lose their rights to the animal. To lose their rights to the firearm, they have to lose their rights to it through a criminal proceeding because due process and civil rights protect someone from losing their rights arbitrarily. So to create criminal statutes that allow the government to deprive the abuser of their rights to protect victims. Uh, there's clearly a need to continue the ongoing use of criminal statutes to protect animals, but there has long been a trend in animal law that focuses on increasing criminal penalties as a means of protecting animals, including higher mandatory minimum sentences. 
As a society, we have long been aware of the harms of such policies in criminal law. Uh, popular culture 20 years ago was singing about this. Um, now, this is kind of funny, and it's not often you get to use heavy metal legitimately in an academic presentation, so I had to provide this example. All research and successful drug policies show that treatment should be increased and law enforcement decreased while abolishing mandatory minimum sentences. Heavy metal song referencing the drug wars, stating pretty clearly that we as a society have known since 2001 at the very least that mandatory minimum sentences and longer criminal sentences are not effective. Uh, those same policies are not gonna be any different when applied to animal laws. But really there's an even more effective and straightforward quip that I think really sums up this issue in my opinion. You don't get animals out of cages by putting people in them. Alternatively, what animal law can take from the broad principles and movement of environmental justice in this regard is a holistic approach that is careful about criminal justice issues and takes into account disparate impacts of disenfranchised or minority communities. We don't need longer sentences to take abused animals away from abusers. We can simply advocate for reforms that include forfeiture, bans on future ownership, and mandatory rehabilitation, counseling, or other treatment. Um, now, before I pass it back to Alexa, I'm going to at length, uh, at least for the next 15 or 20 minutes, discuss a few specific areas of animal law to highlight how, in addition to the significant justice issues that impact animal law because of its criminal law connections, most animal laws are actually a very specific reflection of the dominant American cultural use of animals, which is the other half of the justice reforms we're really advocating for today. What I mean is that laws protect, prohibit, and limit the use of animals, not based on coherent objective assessment of what animals really need or how they should be protected for their own sake, but rather how we as people use animals in different ways and how those uses should be protected. The easiest way to explain what I mean and to start this section of my discussion is to talk about the definition of animals in our laws and exemptions to them in our criminal laws. Um, so we're gonna start here by looking at these two state law definitions for animals under their criminal codes for animal cruelty. In the first example, we see that under cruelty to animals, an animal by definition shall not include fish, crustacea, or mollusks. Um, a little strange, we'll get back to that in a second. The second exempts basically every type of farmed animal or hunted animal from the definition of animal in its section by exempting livestock, uh, preserved whitetails, game, fur-bearing, animal fish, reptiles, um, and any non-game species declared to be a nuisance. Um, so, what we see here is exemptions from the definition of animal that in one case is a little peculiar. Uh, the first case that animals shall not include fish. Why fish? Well, when you learn that the law is from Delaware, an Atlantic coast state with a massive fishing industry, it makes a little bit more sense that they'd focus exclusively on exempting cruelty from one of their massive agricultural industries. Uh, Similarly, the second law is from Iowa, a state with massive industrial livestock operations. Um, but it's a section C that's really interesting to me. Um, and it shows really explicitly that the context of animals being abused or used in our system is, is defined by our use of them. Um, but the section D is also very interesting as well. So, like I said, it explicitly exempts categories of use of animals, game animals, livestock, nuisance animals. Um, but let's follow the code for a second here to look at this a bit more. So this is the animal cruelty code definition, but it also references to non-game species declared to be a nuisance under this section here. So if we go to this section, we actually find out that the animal cruelty code references the wildlife conservation code, which then further defers to a regulatory agency to decide which, uh, you know, in the conservation side of environmentalism isn't that unfamiliar. The federal government also regulates protections for endangered species. Um, 
But here it says that nuisance animals shall not be protected wildlife. But if we look back at the previous statute, that's not actually what happens. Um, it actually states that an animal is not an animal if it becomes a nuisance uh, as decided by a regulatory agency. Um, the law strips nuisance animals of their status as animals uh, if for, by instance, they find by their abundance, they are a nuisance. You no longer are an animal if you are inconvenient to society. Um, kind of a strange kind of definition. Now, I feel like opening with this kind of statutory code really is a great example that highlights how and why farmed animals are at the epicenter of animal law, uh, because there's this huge, vast difference between what treatment of farmed animals is allowed and non-farm animals and farmed animals themselves are actually split amongst different categories of how much we can abuse them. Um, so I just showed you one example of how states actually exempt livestock from animal cruelty laws, but let's look at another one and actually the most common one. Um, here we see 37 state laws uh, that exempt cruelty uh, from their codes for what is known as traditional husbandry practices. At the bottom here, we have our local Colorado code that states nothing in this part, uh, shall affect if accepted animal husbandry practices utilized by any person in the care of a companion or livestock animals. Um, all 37 of these codes are similar. They exempt from their anti-cruelty laws, um, traditional husbandry practices. Um, these exemptions from anti cruelty laws implicitly recognize that normal farming practices treat animals' cruelty. If they didn't, they wouldn't need to be exempt. Uh, and that's further exemplified by what the umbrella of animal husbandry exemptions really are, um, which are otherwise commonly recognized as animal cruelty if done to other animals, such as tail docking or castration without anesthesia. Um, some states even try to do what I call show laws or feign laws that uh, feign greater protections through interesting mechanisms. Uh, here's an example from North Carolina. It is actually civil remedy for animal cruelty, which allows any interested party, including an organization, to file suit against an abuser without an ownership property or possessory stake. That party may then be awarded ownership and possession of the animal in the dispute. Uh, there still remains in this, however, an exemption for, quote, lawful activities conducted for the purposes of production of livestock, poultry, or aquatic species, meaning that, once again, the law still protects animals within the context of the traditional husbandry practices. Um, but it's notoriously difficult to enforce these protections, even if they weren't exempted from the cruelty codes. Um, even if all these exemptions didn't exist, it, it's notoriously difficult to prove this abuse, the systemic abuse on farms anyway. Stop. Um, one second here, technology issue. <laughs> um, Sorry. No problem. Anyway, it's very difficult to enforce these even without these exemptions because um, you have to get in and prove that this behavior is being done anyway, um, which requires basically undercover investigations of some sort. Um, and that's notoriously difficult to successfully do. There, there are many organizations that focus on this, but um, yeah, it, it's notoriously difficult to engage in these other undercover investigations that require employee whistleblowing um, because you need the evidence to bring these claims of abuse. Think about uh, abuse in a slaughterhouse, for example, given the context of this North Carolina uh, civil law. For example, how are you going to file a claim in a court and get an animal freed when even if you could get evidence of the abuse from the kill floor, 
how are you going to file that in a court of law and get the animal out of there before it's actually just killed? It's impossible. Um, that doesn't mean that actually states haven't tried to make this even harder, even though there are already exemptions in place for animal cruelty. Um, it, it's strangely eerie how similarly states actually respond to both environmental and animal advocates because the attempts to harshly punish environmental protesters at oil pipelines, uh, just like that, states have also tried to make enforce enforcement of these minimal protections for farm animals equally impossible. Um, in the past decade, states have made significant attempts to criminalize investigations and whistleblowers by passing what is known as AGGAD laws. Um, fortunately, it seems like this trend has died off, mostly because it seems like every AGGAD law was thrown out of a court because they were so egregiously unconstitutional, including this example I'm going to show you now, um, which is not here. I don't know where it is. Um, anyway, the North Carolina law, uh, there was an AGAG law that worked to uh, undermine the effect of their own civil law. So as we saw with their civil law here in the uh, protection for animals, you had a right to civilly sue to get an animal out of the protection or out of the um, ownership or possession of an abuser. So you have the civil right that gives you a right to take it, but it requires that you have to prove that they egregiously abuse the animal outside of the normal types of abuse. While the state simultaneously tried to give a right of action to the abuser to sue you for collecting evidence of that abuse. Uh, the entire system was crazy. Uh, but the AGAG law was actually thrown out of North Carolina. Anyway, um, I'm actually, uh, again, curious if anyone knows of any animal that has been reclaimed from an abuser using this North Carolina uh, law, please, again, uh, send it to me in chat or message me afterwards. I'd be very interested to read about it. Um, but as I referenced earlier, even with sufficient evidence of abuse in the criminal justice section, the state enforcement of agencies uh, tend to punish individual abusers while leaving the managers who allowed the abuse employed and the corporate interests unscathed, permitting the cycle of abuse to start anew. Um, if for whatever reason you were actually able to be successful in a civil suit, I guess the only loss that they would have would be the loss of their single cow that you got out of their abusive slaughterhouse or factory farm. Um, these cruelty exemptions create really a lower class of farmed animals that are permitted to be abused in ways that other animals are not. Thus, the apparent rationale for the treatment is not based on the welfare or humane practices, but rather upon uh, the efficiency of the objectives of factory farming or how we intend to use them. Farmed animals are also then divided further into different categories of use, most notably through slaughter exemptions. There are two types of exemptions imposed on animals uh, for slaughter. The first are categorical exemptions that include entire groups of animals, such as poultry. Um, the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, now here I'm gonna try and jump ahead because I think my slides are just out of order. So we'll see if we can find it. Here it is. Um, the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act provides protections for cows, pigs, horses, mules, sheep, which must be stunned or unconscious before slaughter, but does not include requirements for poultry, including chickens, turkey, duck, geese, so on and so forth. Uh, the only real protections that chickens get um, is a related regulatory rule that details poultry slaughter as limited to this here. Um, which states that they must be slaughtered in accordance with the good commercial practices in a manner that will result in thorough bleeding of the carcass to ensure breathing has stopped prior to scalding. Uh, there's not a lot of real humane discussion there. It's exclusively about the economics really of the process. Um, and there's no actual definition as to what exactly constitute good commercial practices. Um, there's nothing in the statute or regulations requiring birds be stunned, for example, prior to slaughter, unlike other farmed animals. 
the second real category of exemptions from slaughter are ritual slaughter from cruelty laws. Um, for example, the Humane Slaughter Act acknowledges as humane um, the slaughter in accordance with ritual requirements whereby the animals suffer loss of consciousness by anemia of the brain caused by the simultaneous and instantaneous severance of carotid arteries with sharp instrument and handling in connection with such slaughtering. Um, the foundational kind of case that addresses this issue and kind of points out how really egregious our laws are in terms of societal preference and cultural values um, is what's known as Church of Lukumi Bablu I versus the City of Hialeah. Um, and the issue in that case is whether Hialeah, Florida, they passed an ordinance prohibiting the possession of animals for ritual sacrifice for slaughter. Um, and it was determined that that was in violation of the First Amendment's free exercise clause. That's primarily because the city council members adopted the prohibitions after the establishment of a Santeria church in the community. Uh, the Supreme Court actually held that these ordinances specifically targeted practicers of Santeria faith and singled them out as a community in part because almost the only conduct subject to the ordinances was the religious exercise of Santeria church members. The ordinance itself purported to prevent unnecessary killing and cruelty to animals, um, but the ordinance simultaneously exempted kosher slaughterhouses, regular slaughterhouses, hunting, fishing, pest extermination, euthanasia, and even the feeding of live rabbits to greyhounds. Um, thus, the law failed the strict scrutiny test of the First Amendment and was declared unconstitutional in kind of this rare instance of animal law. The first set of exemptions, uh, really the, the slaughter exemptions, um, which I, I like to just call the chicken slaughter rule, showcase that our use of protections go through extraordinary links, not only for the protection of our traditional uses, but m the most efficient and cost effective method to implement those uses. Um, the Santeria ban, however, shows that there is a pattern of legal restrictions protecting animals, and it's not based on a broader protection for the animal's sake. Uh, for instance, in that case, they were trying to ban specific methods of slaughter that were exactly the same as other traditional practices. But a classification for the abuse of things deemed as unnecessary uh, by dominant cultural perspectives. The classification of animals and their exemptions from protections of cruelty and the methods of slaughter are simple extensions of the limits of their use rather than limits of suffering. More generally, slaughter methods and their exemptions exempt entire classes of animals without explanation or reason and label methods of slaughter as humane because they're of their traditional use, rather than adopting a cohesive or sound policy to prevent cruelty and suffering to animals. Um, Alexa is actually going to provide an apt comparison that really highlights the level of cultural racism or xenophobia that can be inherent in these slaughter laws and exemptions when she comes back to discuss some of our proposed solutions. Um, but we have limited time, so I'm going to move forward into a few final areas of animal law. And I can't really talk about how farm animals are treated worse without telling you what animals are treated better. And traditionally, that is a class of animals known as companion animals. Um, companion animals have traditionally the most protections and are at the forefront of advancement of the individual status of animals in the United States law. Um, for example, over 90% of Americans who have command animals regard them as family members. A recent analysis from the Pet America Products Associated, Association calculated Americans spend $72 billion on their companion animals. Uh, really, this is just to highlight um, how much of a status we prioritize as Americans to companion animals and pets versus all other animals. Um, this number from the American Pet Products Association doesn't include money for legal fees, representation, or pet trusts, just for reference. Um, so companion animals received a special attention and protection because of their societal value to humans. We use and treat them increasingly like families, so we have laws that protect that status. Pet trusts and best interest standards and custody disputes are only a few of the elevated legal standards and protections that apply to companion animals. 
uh, what animals we applied this term to socially is, is really subjective, as a companion animal does not necessarily exclude traditional farm animals. Uh, for, for example, it's not uncommon these days to see people talk about their pet goat or pig. Um, legal limitations, however, do exist on what types of animals may receive these benefits, even in more progressive jurisdictions. Uh, for example, above, uh, California permits and courts to order uh, determinations of who will provide for care of an animal during legal separations of parties, but limits its jurisdiction, you see at the bottom here, to, where's my cursor, uh, pet animals, um, which is defined as an animal that is community property and kept as a household pet. Uh, this potentially excludes boarding animals or boarded companion animals or outdoor animals, such as horses um, or potentially goats or maybe chickens or ducks. You can see the law here and its operative limitation with the word household. Um, so if it's not in the household, it may be actually excluded. Most jurisdictions, however, have laws regulating um, that moving animals between different types of different classes, such as farm or companion or even wild, are difficult or impossible. Uh, so the limits of use are usually controlled through zoning ordinances or other very similar municipal government codes. Uh, they have immense power in regulating the movement of animals between these arbitrary kind of state designated classes for their common use. Once restricted through, uh, th these things were once restricted through the concept of nuisance laws. So. Municipalities introduced zoning laws to prevent farming activities in suburban areas of expanding cities because, you know, noise, water, odor, pollution resulting from farming activities. Industrial agriculture has immense impacts. Uh, I believe there was actually a panel earlier from Pilk that talked a lot about this. The air, water, quality pollution that they cause is immense. Uh, so rather than having these issues addressed through nuisance laws, municipalities and governments implemented zoning laws to permanently resolve these land use conflicts between what was viewed as incompatible land uses. So like industrial and commercial versus residential. Um, nevertheless, a real byproduct of zoning control creates this dichotomy of use and location for animals. Zoning control methods um, limited discordant land uses by ending farming practices in residential districts. So it restricted the availability to keep those same animals that were farmed, primarily used for farming, in these new residential controlled districts. Um, so currently as many as 79% of Americans actually reside in suburban or urban areas that are likely to have zoning districts um, that restrict agricultural practices and any restriction on the possession of a specific animal in a residential district creates an immense barrier towards the type of companion animals that humans can have. Um, if you're not allowed to have livestock, the only place you could have a pet, you know, livestock defined animal would be outside in an agricultural district as 79% live in urban districts. You have very limited space and housing that you could even choose from if you wanted one of these animals. Um, so take, for example, the commonly structured municipal code in Westminster, Colorado. Uh, it places all animal codes in Title VI of its police regulations. And under Chapter 7, Animals, it details all the control restrictions concerning the municipal regulations and zoning restrictions of animals including a separate section, 6712, that's the restrictions and sale of possession of animals. Um, and it limits the sale and possession of animals. And Animals Limited provides that it's unlawful to keep or maintain livestock. So then if we go and look at what livestock is, as defined in this section of the code, 671.1, um, under its definitions, and we look down at livestock, it says that livestock is any animal commonly kept or harbored as a source of food hides income through agricultural sale. Um, as, as you see here, it limits and specifically includes horses, mules, sheep, goats, cattle, swines, chickens, ducks, geese, pigeons, turkeys, peafowl, and so on, uh, bees even. So you could not keep these as pets because or companion animals, and they can't receive the benefits of those because they're livestock and prohibited in the city. 
Um, I have not specifically compiled data to make it readily available on how many municipalities have these types of animals restrictions or how many are under criminal code enforcement. But it is very, very difficult to find urban jurisdictions that lack these specific types of restrictions, especially towards uh, the keeping of livestock. Now, it actually works the other way too. Companion animals also have restrictions on their use, but ones that prevent them from transforming into farmed animals. Um, the total prohibition on certain uses of companion animals for farming or agricultural protection or practices uh, protects companion animals from being farm animals and subject to the same abuses as farm animals. Uh, for example, the Dog and Cat Meat Trade Prohibition Act of 2018 proposed to prohibit the slaughter, possession, trade, shipment, transportation, delivery, movement, receipt, purchase, sale, or donation of dog or cat for human consumption. Um, in explaining the purpose of the bill, one of its sponsors, no, it's not there. One of its sponsors uh, described it as a reflection of our values and gives us greater standing in urging all other countries to end this horrific practice once and for all. And an animal advocate of a national organization defended the need for this bill by saying, these animals are our dutiful companions and not our dinner fare. Uh, this law was actually passed not as the dog uh, and cat slaughter prohibition act, but part of the larger omnibus farm bill at the end of 2018. So this is in fact law now. Uh, these same justifications um, described by the sponsor of this original bill um, are and the advocates rationale to prohibit the slaughter of other types of companion animals, such as horses, are, are very similar. Um, horses are also protected via temporary spend, uh, spending bans uh, through uh, bills that limit spending through the federal government. Um, there are also proposals to permanently protect horses from slaughter through acts such as the Safeguard American Food Exports Act. Um, advocates of that ban, including one of the representatives who also uh, who did introduce the SAFE Act, described the slaughter of horses for human consumption as a barbaric practice that must be ended. Um, so I'll have to jump back here because I have a slide about this earlier. So. A barbarian, by definition, is a derogatory term that expresses that a person or culture is uncivilized. And here is a direct definition of barbaric as well, which you can see reflects that same thing, um, of relating to a characteristic group of people who are alien to another land, culture. Um, really what this does it, is it creates a sense of otherness between competing cultures based upon specific food choices. But it also creates this rank system of values uh, that value certain animals over others based on what our traditional uses are as Americans. Uh, this sense of prioritization of certain animals and certain cultures over other really creates this underlying and inherent inequality that pervades American society, not only between our animals, but between our peoples. Um, the current state of animal law really is just a series of limits on what people can do to animals consistent with their limited socially accepted uses. So these illogical exemptions, species and breed preferences and prejudices, and a focus on criminal enforcement disproportionately applied against minority and low income communities are the dominant practice rather than the exception. Uh, these types of unjust trends diminish the moral authority of the practice of any type of law, but they're especially concerning in a field that's premised on the moral expansion and protection for animals. Uh, ignoring human beings behind the animals only exasperates these issues, especially when the gap in access for justice uh, for impacted communities is so extreme. The parallels and echoes to early environmental law are really uncanny. Uh, criticism that animal advocates are immoral for protecting animals over or instead of people are very common. This criticism of animal advocates is likely, you know, like I said, it's very like the early environmental advocates um, and the criticism of them for protecting wilderness areas used primarily by wealthy and white uh, communities while ignoring the rampant pollution and health impacts faced by minority communities such as 
what happened with the PCB protests. Animal law and animal rights movements have never, nevertheless gained great traction in recent history as Americans increasingly support more stringent protections for animals and increased rights. But the state of the law suggests now may be the time to take a cue from the environmental justice movement and for animal advocates to make animal law more inclusive. Um, really kind of plucking the low hanging fruit of criminal prosecutions for immigrant farm workers accused of animal abuse is and has been described by other animal attorneys as the lowest common denominator of social agreement when it comes to improving the status of animals. Animal advocates pursuing greater reform by caging people are more likely to entrench dominant practices that separate animals into these higher and low status categories, such as farmed or companion, rather than fundamentally change the protection for animals. Uh, to move forward requires applying the lessons of distributive justice, inclusion, and equality to the practice of law. And that's where I'm going to bring Alexa back in to talk specifically about some of the suggestions that we have for those ideas. So while animal law is not in its infancy, it is starting to enter the mainstream social consciousness. There have even been a couple of animal law panels at this conference. Um, it certainly has its foothold in the practice of law with entire academic programs dedicated to educating fledgling attorneys about the field. Animal advocacy is at a point where it can begin and indeed needs to begin considering a holistic perspective. And here is where we identify environmental justice's impact upon environmentalism. Parallel to early environmentalism's narrow scope, animal advocacy and animal law suffer from oversights that contribute to discriminatory and disparate treatment of lower class and minority groups. As Jeremy pointed out, there is a failure to include consideration of the disproportionate impacts of such changes on marginalized human communities as well as among animals. Opinions and perspectives within the field of animal law and animal advocacy are varied. I know that this is not an animal law conference and some of you may not be familiar with the field. So I figured I would at least touch upon two basic points. For example, there can be staunch debates between animal welfareists who seek incremental animal protections for the continued use of animals and animal abolitionists who strive to remove the property status of all animals and aim to stop the use of animals. Additionally, among scholars and advocates, there are disagreements about what exactly is an animal for legal purposes. And this is evident even in statutory codes Jeremy referenced. Um, as another quick example, the Colorado State Animal Cruelty Statute categorizes an animal as any dumb living creature. Well, what does this mean for the argument that animals are sentient beings? In Park County, Colorado, an animal is defined as any living vertebrate creature, domestic or wild, including dogs, but excluding estrays, which are livestock running at large. We recognize that humans are in fact animals, but use the term animal to describe non-humans, creating a sense of additional otherness between ourselves and the rest of the animal kingdom. Having these debates means that advocates are in a prime position to consider differing perspectives and welcome improvements to make the field more inclusive and holistic. The law is the vehicle for governing human action. Therefore, the division of treatment of animals can and must be equitable based on how humans are likely to interact with animals. It is not so easy to define these issues. Indeed, scholars and advocates have written entire dissertations and law review articles on these topics. But advocates must be cautious not to conflate the human's intended use with the responsibilities that humans owe to these animals. Now, while answering questions of legal strategy and advocacy initiatives are central to reconciling the differing philosophies of animal rights, these questions do not need to be answered here today to apply principles of equity to the field. This is what we term animal socio-equality. 
Animal socio-equality is the equitable treatment of non-human animals and the equitable distribution of the benefits and penalties related to non-human animal use without prejudice based on socio-cultural or socio-economic values. To be clear, by putting forward this notion of animal socio-equality, we do not seek to halt the progression of animal law. We do not suggest that advocates should tolerate the suffering of animals if it alleviates the suffering of people. Rather, we hope to advance the movement and we urge advocates to recognize that disconnecting the reality of impacts on people from how the law treats animals creates injustice. This is something that must be addressed and something that we can look to the environmental justice movement for inspiration. So as a first point, animal socio-equality requires data. Data was the spurring point for action in the environmental justice movement and can be similarly useful in identifying priorities and goals for animal socio-equality within the animal law movement. There are glaring data gaps in nearly every aspect of animal law for how the laws are enforced related to reporting, policing, prosecution, and sentencing. This lack of relevant data makes identifying and taking appropriate action exceptionally difficult. Thus, animal advocates should push for reform that requires detailed data collection and publication related to animal issues in criminal and regulatory enforcement. These efforts have already begun. For example, as Jeremy said, there is movement to collect some of this data, such as the relatively new FBI animal crimes database, but the data gathering effort needs to be wider and more accessible to the general public. This enhanced and increased data collection initiative would provide the sufficient knowledge to understand the scope of issues related to suffering animals, what areas of the law are deficient in protecting them, and what would likely be the best remedies. As a second point, implementing animal socio-equality must be both about humans and animals. Where animals today have no capacity for self-involvement, standing, or self-representation in the law, access to justice must expand for all animal issues. Currently, access to justice in animal law is inherently defined by the nature of the existing legal system of animals as property. Expanding access to justice means that attorneys must continue expanding their capacity for representing indigent or low-income clients who are the voice of animals. Expanded independent representation is essential to animal socio-equality because it pushes the boundaries of how animals can be represented in court whether that be through guardian ad litem proceedings or altered legal standards, such as best interest of the pet in custody cases. This court related advocacy must continue while legislative reform is occurring. Such criminal justice reforms are being made to better protect animals even as we speak. For example, in Colorado, the state legislation is attempting to pass a bill that would prohibit or that would appoint a courtroom animal advocate in abuse cases to protect the interests of the animal victim. This is one way to ensure that animal victims are protected and placed in loving homes upon human conviction without contributing to the over-incarceration problem. This property-focused effort must be addressed in tandem with the ongoing legal battle for animal legal personhood so that progress can continue to be made. After all, as lawyers, we are forced to work within the box that animals are property until courts or Congress says otherwise. The most common example of where humans require access to justice to protect animals is in impoundment cases, such as dog bite cases. When animals are impounded, there is no ready method of separating out animal interests and guardian interests. Thus, to release an animal held in such a circumstance or to prevent their unjust euthanasia, animal attorneys are required to represent the animal's guardian. Additionally, we urge animal attorneys to consider expanded defense work in the course of such expanded access to justice. It is not uncommon for animal attorneys to have blanket bans on representation of individuals who have been charged with animal-related crimes, such as animal abuse and neglect, 
but a factual examination of certain, can certain cases may reveal that defense work actually is in the best interest of the animal. Some cruelty, neglect, dangerous dog designations, and impoundment cases are areas of special concern. For example, do the facts indicate physical animal abuse or neglect, such as through starvation, torture, or maiming, or is it the result of an improper zoning license for a rescue's new adoption facility? Are pet guardians of color being railroaded into forfeiting their pets for alleged dog bites where the evidence is iffy at best simply because they don't qualify for a public defender? Policing and enforcement may take the approach of making charges consistent with the desired outcome in animal cases, such as ownership forfeiture and destruction of the animal. Taken in tandem with prosecutorial discretion, charges may be dropped or added and offers may be made to dismiss for forfeiture of animals. Criminal defense presents a nuanced challenge for a more holistic approach towards animal socioequality. Let me give you a more detailed example from my own practice to show you what I mean. I have gotten permission to share this with you all today. So let's take a look at the example of an impoundment of a homeless woman's companion and emotional support animal, a rooster. The validity of emotional support animals and their differentiation from service animals is a whole other panel that we could be talking about, but I would strongly encourage everyone to research this difference and refrain from ableist commentary on emotional support animals. So back to the example, this companion animal, a rooster, is a type of animal that is regularly prohibited by ordinance because he's classified as livestock. So in this example, animal control discovered the rooster while performing an unrelated duty in the neighborhood. They heard a rooster crow from an inoperable RV that was parked on a third party's property. The woman and her rooster were inside the RV. So upon discovery, animal control made it immediately known that the animal needed to be removed from the jurisdiction. After the vehicle owner naively consented to animal control entering the vehicle, enforcement agents noted a recent bird dropping on the floor. Animal control then seized the rooster and charged the woman with animal abuse and neglect because of that bird dropping, in addition to charges for possessing prohibited livestock and other variance ordinance violations. The municipal prosecutor offered to drop animal abuse and neglect charges if the rooster was surrendered to animal control to be euthanized and refused under any circumstance to release the rooster even to a sanctuary. In order to save this rooster from euthanasia, the woman required representation to force the municipality to release the rooster to a sanctuary. Even in court, the prosecutor attempted to scare the judge into a slippery slope argument would allowing this one singular rooster to go free to a sanctuary and keep its life allow dangerous exotic support animals freely into and out of the city? What was to stop someone from bringing in an alligator into the city illegally and then remove it without that alligator being killed? The whole argument was, why should they allow the animal to live when it was deemed to be prohibited in the city, even though there is a readily available solution? Take the animal back out of the city. This indigent and homeless woman required legal representation in order to save the life of her beloved companion, even while having to give up ownership to save his life. Even the judge would not accept that the woman herself would physically relocate out of the city with the rooster. Ultimately, the judge ruled that the rooster be permanently forfeited and sent the rooster out of the city limits to a farm sanctuary. So these types of impoundments are ripe for expanded defense practice utilizing the principle of animal socioequality. It provides access to justice for both the marginalized person and innocent animals, despite the optics that the case was the defense of an individual charged with animal abuse. As we have discussed at length in this panel today, criminal laws are disproportionately applied to disenfranchised groups and penalties are applied to both the human and the animal. The human may be jailed and the animal may lose its life. Access to justice for humans dealing with animal law issues helps animals. It advances major objectives of animal socioequality, ending disparate treatment and impacts of animal law on both humans and animals. 
Thus, with increased representation from private attorneys to assist with the overburden upon public defenders, the injustices of the practice of animal law can be alleviated. As a third point, advocates should carefully consider and review their courses of action in both representation and advocacy for impacts on disenfranchised animals or communities. For instance, advocates must consider whether defense of charismatic species or niche interests subconsciously harms other animals. Let's look at the example of slaughter, horses versus cows. In addition to emotional cultural appeals that horse slaughter is barbaric, a term problematic in its own right. Advocates have stated that horses have a unique physiology that causes them to experience significant increased suffering during slaughter. It is, however, more accurate to state that horse physiology requires a different method of handling for slaughter than is currently used for the most analogous livestock in the United States, cows. You could argue that cramming a horse through a process designed for cows causes more suffering on the horse than it does for the cow. But stating that horses cannot be humanely slaughtered at all because of their unique physiology implies that other animals such as cows are slaughterable because they lack that unique physiology of the horse that creates additional suffering. Advocates then run the risk of implicitly justifying the suffering or use of some animals with such arguments. Now, as a horse lover and horse guardian myself, I'm not over here advocating that horses should be slaughtered. I'm trying to point out the disparity and false dichotomy in this very common argument, which is ultimately fueled by sentiment and social norm. Would the same argument apply just north of the border in Canada where horses are regularly consumed? Just as it was unjust for environmentalists to preserve Yosemite by removing Native Americans, it is unjust to protect horses by justifying the slaughter of cows. As our final recommendation, I would like to echo again what Jeremy addressed because it cannot be emphasized enough. Advocates should give special consideration to any action that seeks an increased use of the criminal justice system against individuals because criminal enforcement necessarily has disparate impacts. When advancing the interests of animals in the legal system, advocates can consider alternative methods of restorative and rehabilitative justice rather than reactionary and punitive justice. Similarly, advocates should consider ways they would work with low-level participants in animal industries or at least be cautious about the method for implementing undercover investigations to prevent impacts on minority community segments and accomplish the true goals of these investigations. One such goal could be a straightforward expose, such as the recent Costco chicken expose. The quintessential 499 rotisserie chicken has been found to be the subject of egregious animal abuse at factory farms. As the journalist Nicholas Kristoff states, torture a single chicken in your backyard and you risk arrest. Abuse tens of millions of them? Why, that's agribusiness. By arming the public with this information, consumers can vote with their dollars and create change far larger than going after low-level animal crimes that surely disproportionately impact people of color. Protecting animals does not require disenfranchised human communities to disproportionately suffer for low-level gains for animals. Given that there is a serious question about the effectiveness of criminal punishments actually stopping criminal behaviors, animal advocates would likely achieve greater success in protecting animals through alternative means than longer sentencing or more people incarcerated. So to sum up, in order to accomplish the end goals of animal protection, animal law must be equitable, inclusive, and respectful of all animals, human and non-human alike. Until it changes, animal law will be perceived as more of a polarizing philosophical aspiration than as a legitimate legal jurisprudence, and all animals will fail to get the protections that they deserve. We hope that this panel today has provided not only educational insight, but also inspiration for animal advocates. Animal socioequality will carve a path of increased acceptance for animal law as environmental justice did for environmental law and will pave the way for broader reforms for animal rights. We hope that those of you joining us today can take these recommendations we have proposed as they are not just implementations for attorneys and for those practicing within the field of animal law, but can be promoted by anyone who has a passion for animal advocacy 
animal welfare and animal rights. If anyone would like to speak with us personally about any of these issues we addressed today or learn more about our work, please feel free to utilize our contact info on the slide on screen. And thanks again for joining us, all of you. We hope to see you in person and also perhaps virtually next year. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Jeremy and Alexa. Um, we are five minutes over, but there's one more question that came through Alexa during your presentation, if you don't mind me asking it. Uh, the question was, what are your opinions on forced sterilization to impede the population growth of non-native and invasive species? So I do think that is a particularly nuanced question that we don't have a whole lot of time to dive into today. But I do think that it can be something that is given some more thought and consideration and debate among the community in order to ensure that all animals affected by any sort of control mechanisms among species in the wilderness be equitable for both the species affected and also equitable for the communities who enjoy those species, who are connected to those species as well. Um. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a difficult question to ask, especially without knowing about uh, more of the context, right? I mean, the biggest issue in the United States on this is probably wild horses burrows. There's vast disagreement between animal advocates on what should be done. For example, there's one vein of um, advocacy that suggests that the forced sterilizations are really only due uh, to the necessity of having to open up wild and public lands to cattle grazing. So would those sterilizations be necessary at all if there weren't cattle grazing on those same lands? So, uh, you know, questions like these are difficult and have complex and difficult answers. And we're not even suggesting we have the specific answers on a lot of these questions, but rather we're saying that in consideration of what should actually be done on some of these issues, you have to look at a holistic kind of perspective of the issue, which would mean in this case, like, do you have to carry out the sterilization at all? Or is it something that could be solved through another means, such as restricting cattle grazing, perhaps? All right, and I don't see any more questions coming through. Thank you, Alexa and Jeremy, so much for your time and for that panel. Um, it was amazing. Um, for anybody attending, I did in the Zoom and the YouTube chat, I'm sorry, I put the link to the CLE credit and flaw donation Google Doc, just one more time for anybody who joined us late. Um, and just a reminder, all of the PILK panels from this past week should be available at some point next week on this PILK YouTube. And this was the last panel of the 39th PILC. For all attendees, I would like to thank you for attending these panels over the past week. To all our panelists, especially Jeremy and Alexa right now, thank you for your time and your willingness to share your experiences. And I hope everybody has a safe week. Um, thank you guys.